So Nellie gets home from work and she sees an invitation to a special meeting of the sorority. Well, she's excited to go. She, of course, being the last past active president a couple, like three, four months ago. And um, this was Myra Davis's first meeting as president. So she was super excited until she saw the agenda. When she saw the agenda, she saw the very few ladies that were in there were very excited about changing the name, symbol and colors, which confused her quite a bit because she had initiated these girls just a couple of months before. And here they were trying to change the defining points of the sorority. Well, she talked to them and she tried to prevail upon them with what she referred to as reason and logic because she, of course, had been a member of the sorority um, for over two years, had also studied fraternities and sororities and how they affect universities extensively, so much so that her paper got awards and um, high marks and also um, regard was guarded by Howard University is one of the main reasons um, it was so important to have them. So she didn't understand why the girls didn't understand why it was so important to keep those things in place, especially since Alpha Kappa Alpha means by culture and by merit, which is the way that they serve to uplift and by culture and by merit. Well, she saw she couldn't prevail upon the girls and was even more like surprised they invited her to go along with their plan. And she was like, um, no, I don't think so. So in come, enters Norma Boyd, who, of course, had initiated Nellie, and she talked to the uh, Nellie and sorry, Norma and Minnie and th some other stores that were in the D.C. area. And she was like, did you guys favor the change? They were like, absolutely not. What are you talking about? So they set about a plan to save the sorority. So first they went to administration to see if there could be two sororities. They said, fine. She went to George Cook, who was also part of this, um, the administration and said, listen, what can we do to preserve our sorority so that something like this never happens again. He suggested incorporation. They then set up the proposal, the constitution, the changes, and set about the motion and then got approval from the soror from the administration to incorporate the sorority in January of 1913. Certain people will say, well, you know, why did it take so long to incorporate? Well, you have to remember AKA was the first people to do it. No one else had ever done it, a sorority, and no other D9 entity had ever done it entirely correctly at this point. So AKA still remains the... So AKA still um, remains the only entity of the original eight sororities and fraternities that only had to incorporate once because back then women were uh, not to be necessarily heard. We didn't even have the right to vote. So let alone um, establish a Negro sorority in our name proved to be difficult. So we had to figure it out as well as establish protocol for a black sorority. Now the very next day, the Howard Journal um, publishes a newspaper that says that there are some new members and new elected offices officers in the sorority, which of course is news to the AKs who don't live on campus because there had been no initiation and a lot of these girls' names were not on the roll and they did not know how they became vice president at at freshmen um, or any of those things. So that was surprising. But, you know, um, the girls who lived on campus decided, okay, they're going to publish this in the newspaper in the Howard Journal, and they say, okay, we're going to go ahead and change the color symbols and name. And they went ahead about writing a new constitution. They wrote um, a new initiation. They also um, got, got help from um, Edward Porter Davis about how to change their name. They got suggestions about colors. And then they submitted in December, in the same month as the um, AKAs who lived off campus, as a proposal to get a charter for to form at um, Howard University. Now, they didn't have a name by this time. So when they submitted a charter, it was like, you know, this organization, but like a blank there, you know, it was requesting a charter. So here's where people get confused. The AKAs who lived on campus received their permission to charter as an organization on January 13th. That same day, they had a meeting and decided to change the name from Alpha Kappa Alpha to Delta Sigma Theta. They changed the colors and they changed the symbol. They did keep the purpose and pretty much everything else the same. So because of the fact that they had um, put these people on roster as, you know, the members of the org, they thought that that kept them as the original soror first black Greek sorority because at the time they were under the assumption that they were the leading uh, sorority. 
not understanding that the other members, um, the AKs who lived off campus, had already gotten permission to incorporate and were already in the process of incorporation. Enter the latter part of January, we find out that AKAs, the ones that live off campus, have incorporated fully. And because of the incorporation being incorporated fully, it is now perpetual. It continues to go on. But not only that, it is protected from any changes made outside of itself. Um, and all changes must go through the boule. And the boule, of course, is listed by people who are no, who are not listed as the AKAs on campus. So Alpha Kappa Alpha, the sorority incorporated gets, okay, we have a boule to make our decisions. While Alpha Kappa Alpha now Delta Sigma Theta, the chapter on Howard's campus um, is, st is wondering how they got it done so quickly, but then also believing, well, we're still viable as the first sorority period. So in the interim of both these groups reorganizing, they pretty much just kind of mind their own business. And by that, Delta Sigma Theta is creating Delta Sigma Theta and Alpha Kappa Alpha is making sure that Alpha Kappa Alpha retains its branding and, and all of those things. So they're each building their own organization. And then we have 1933. Well, 1933, there's a rebranding effort by Delta Sigma Theta where they're at a convention and we're in the same in the same city as Alpha Kappa Alpha Sword is having their convention. And it is a big convention because this is their 20th year. And at the reading of it, Osceola Adams, who used to be an AK and is now a Delta, tells the story and the history of Delta Sigma Theta and to everyone's amazement, she tells the story as written by Marjorie Penn, who was never an AKA, that the sorority was the first Negro sorority. At this, Alpha Kappa Alpha is amazed. They're amazed because they're like, what in the world are you guys talking about? Especially because um, you have to remember how it wasn't the large university it used to be at um, with the beginning in 1907. You had 10 to 12 girls who were college age who all, by the way, became AKAs in 1907. So when the sorority was being planned, some of the Delta founders were actually little girls at Howard Academy. So she was like, what are you guys talking about? You remember when it was a sorority. And enter Marjorie Penn, who has written this story about it being a club. Well, we didn't understand where Alpha Kappa Alpha didn't understand where they got that idea from. It didn't make any sense. The word sorority means sisterhood, and they absolutely had one. So none of it made sense in that regard. So that's when Ethel writes a letter, and she talks about how there's three to 400 people there that can testify to it, how the Constitution testifies to it, but then also how we should be bigger than to think of small things like this um, that we have as Negroes um, should just be better than this. Well, where does the rumor come from then? Well, the rumor comes from Alpha Kappa Alpha women um, who, you know, considered them as heck succeeding, which basically means to disagree. We decided to keep our sorority the same and you decided to change it. So in Alpha Kappa Alpha women's mind, it's like, OK, well, clearly you dropped out of this decision. You didn't agree with the majority of us because, of course, there was more Alpha Kappa Alpha women than there were um, in the room. And just adding women from somewhere doesn't, you know, change that. And so Delta Sigma Theta in their concept, and this is a page out of the history book, um, stated they just merely reorganized. It was never an intent to leave or an intention to leave. So it wasn't this nastiness that everybody has through. They just wanted to change the name, colors, and symbols. Once they realized it was going to kind of be a separation, they said, okay, well, let's just set focus on service as well and make it bigger than ever. So a lot of people want to make it seem as though um, the women who began Delta Sigma Theta did so because of they wanted to do service, which is just a ridiculous idea because, first of all, they were in charge of the time. So they could have just done service. No one needs to change a name to do service. But then also it makes it appear as though these women weren't already doing service, and they were. They actually had a service project. They weren't members for even a full year. And they had already had three service projects, one which was supposed to be set up for a scholarship that had to be delayed a year because of this upheaval. Um, and then they apparently later on, um, even in that October, did an auction where the proceeds were also supposed to go to that scholarship. We don't quite know what happened to that, but 
that in itself is over a century years old. Um, but then also th with that, not only did they have service projects with the sorority, they had service projects within the YWCA. And the girls actually worked together, AKAs and Delta side by side in other organizations. They did so in here. You see the Young Ladies of College and Arts and Science organization, where AKs and Deltas are members of those organizations. And that's to keep in ties with all the people who graduated, who, of course, since this is January 1913, were AKAs. Um, you also have um, the YWCA, the Girls Club, the Science Club, the Pelosi Club. They worked hand in hand. It, once again, it was still a handful of them. And so they dated each other's family members. They partied together. You have to remember, this is a very small, select group of people. So they weren't that petty to be mad at each other about these things. And in fact, everyone knew what happened. Now you have here, you'll see here in the CAC, which became the um, NAWW, our first president, Lucy Slow, with Delta Sigma Theta's first national president, Sadie Mosel Tam, who was by the fact raised by an AK and Alpha, a or who shall I say, partially raised, because her uncle, of course, was Louis B. Moore, who gave Alpha Kappa Alpha permission to form, and her aunt, her, her step aunt, shall I say, was an honorary member of Alpha Kappa Alpha and the house mother. Not to mention her two babysitters who became Delta Sigma Theta were AKAs at the time they babysitted her. Here you have um, Delta founder Myra Davis Hemings, an outgoing Delta president and the incoming president of AKA and um, the original founder Margaret Flagg Holmes at our 50th anniversary where we had our joint convention. Well, not joint, but same convention at Washington 50 years later. So they're commemorating the 50th anniversary of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So you'll see here, everybody's cool. There's no contention. There's no fighting. And all of the stuff about them being enemies are just rumors. <laughs>